Hello and welcome to episode 8. My name is Jamie Hari, the founder of the Marvel and DC Databases. Welcome to episode 8, all about Wonder Woman. We're going to talk a, a bit about uh, some of the uh, goings-on in uh, the New 52 and how she's changed and what's uh, different between her character, her story, her origin, and uh, some of the impacts that uh, the retelling uh, uh, Brian uh, Azzarello has done and the impact it will have on other characters in the DC Universe as well. So uh, jumping right in there, uh, if you haven't read it, spoiler alert, um, we're just uh, starting with the first few issues and, and obviously there was a big change in terms of um, she's not made of clay as it turns out and she's the offspring of a god and uh, what does that uh, what does that mean for say Donna Troy who uh, came along with that sort of same story made of clay and, and and what does that mean for her? I think it means that she has no easy entryway back into the DCU. If if she's going to come back, there's no easy entry point because she doesn't have her origin story was I elaborated on in the mid '90s, I think, or late '90s. Um, who is Donna Troy, and they came up with an answer that she is also made of clay. So if Diane is not made of clay, what is Donna made of? Who knows? I mean, there, there doesn't really seem to be room for her in this Wonder Woman version anyway. So, Do they really need to have an origin story for her, though? It seems that writers these days just go with the preconceived notion that everybody knows who everybody is, and will just throw her into a storyline, and look, here's this character back, you know who she was, new readers, well, doesn't really matter, so just try and catch up along the way. I, I will say, actually, one of the things I really liked about the first six issues of the new Wonder Woman series is how disconnected it is from the rest of the DCU. Um, I think a lot of the books in the New 52, especially the ones with weirder premises, or even the, or even like the the big ones, felt like they had a huge need to force connections with other property. And I, I it's kind of cool when it's like, oh, uh, Frankenstein is teaming up with the Blackhawks or whatever. But I like that Wonder Woman is taking its time to develop as its own series, isolated from everything else, without having to worry about bringing in the rest of the DC bullshit into a story that's perfectly fine by itself. Do we think that there's some sort of editorial influence there? In other words, are they protecting the story to be on its own? Was this a plan, or is this just a, a, a Brian Azzarello feel like he didn't uh, want to incorporate other characters or other storylines? I think it's just Brian Azzarello is used to working that way. And it's a business model that we're seeing a lot more across the board in comic books right now that I love. Uh, that's a lot of the most popular titles at Marvel right now are also doing that thing where they realize nobody wants to get into reading comics when you pick up one issue. Of like, oh, I recognize Batman, and then you pick up one issue, and you're like, who is Captain Stingery? Why should I care? Um, but li like, that's what Hawkeye is doing right now. Uh, everybody loves Hawkeye, and it's because they've figured out that by having Marvel characters do these like little isolated adventures where you just focus on who they are instead of, oh, but don't forget to read Secret Mysterious Avenger Force number 32. I think there is pushback, though. I think there's pushback from the editors against people like Brian Azzarello, right now at DC anyway, or earlier anyway, to be more, to expand more, to cross over more. Like, say, Batwoman was also like that, and Wonder Woman was like that, and then they crossed over in Batwoman, and that was good, but it seems to me like eventually everyone who tries to buck the trend of crossing over and entering the DCU as a whole is going to end up leaving in a rage at some point because somebody said, no, you can't do this thing that you're planning to do because it conflicts with this, and then they'll say, well, that's my entire story out the window, you can't really ignore the fact that you're in the same universe as all these other characters, especially like super-powered characters where something is going to go on and you're going to notice or something is going to like, there's got to be some kind of crossover, some connection. It doesn't have to be all the time, but you have to recognize that you're in this, like, unless your characters are specifically in like outer space for long periods of time and aren't near Earth, like Green Lantern, you can kind of have them separated from the majority of the the other characters, but like there is going to be a crossover at some point in time. You can't like neglect that fact. 
That's that's true. Elena, what do you think? Well, Mike's got a really good point, but this particular story doesn't make sense to have the rest of the superhero universe in it because this is Diana's personal story looking at her, the retelling of her origin, but also they've got all these gods floating around, and yes, Superman could show up and uh, punch with the best of them, but it just doesn't make sense to have most of the established superheroes on, in her story at this point. So. Yeah, but you'd have to think that when Poseidon like shows up in the middle of nowhere, um, that that's going to get noticed by somebody else like that has a superpower that's in the general area. I think it's always struck me as a funny thing about the Wonder Woman mythos that uh, of all, it's kind of sad that Wonder Woman is considered one of the big three and her books, it always seems like people kind of care the least, which is really unfortunate. Um, I think a lot of it is just being a female character and a lot of male readers are less likely to get into a female character. But... It's funny to me that so much of the time, whereas, like, Superman and Batman crossovers, like, everybody's always... When something's going down in Gotham City, despite the fact that it's just, like, one city in this huge nation of superpowers, everybody's showing up, like, we gotta fix Gotham. Whereas, because nobody's reading Wonder Woman stories, she's like, well, the, the structure of the cosmos is crumbling in a war with the gods. And people are like, you, you got it? You got it figured out? War with the... I, you know... I just don't really care about Poseidon that much. I feel like you can probably deal with this. Like, I don't want to deal with that. Magic is my weakness. Yeah, <laughs> Superman would be flying by and he'd be like, huh, that's a giant fish in the middle of England. Okay, I'm out of here. See ya. <laughs> it's kind of, a, like, just publication-wise, it's funny to think about. We consider Wonder Woman as one of the big three, but she has overwhelmingly been, like, one of the most neglected characters at DC for a long time. To the point where even, like, Green Lantern who is, I would say, the second most made fun of big-name hero at DC after Aquaman, just because of the whole yellow thing. Like, Green Lantern's holding down four titles regularly, all the time, sometimes pushing even more, and people are buying them, whereas Wonder Woman, who is considered a much bigger-name character, we are right now living in a golden age of Wonder Woman stories because we have the most Wonder Woman series published at once ever, which is two. One and a Wonder half. Woman, <laughs> one and a half, yeah. Wonder Woman and Superman slash Wonder Woman. So, quick question. So, uh, how do how do we feel? Like, so, Wonder Woman's obviously different uh, in the, the current telling by Azarello than in the past. How do we feel that's going to impact um, not only sales and interest in her character, but um, perhaps uh, the tie-ins with, obviously, she's with Superman right now and all that. How do we, how do we think her character is either improved or worsened by the changes in her writing? I think she's improved to an... I mean, it's a different kind of Wonder Woman than we've seen before, uh, depending on who's writing, I guess. But this is a more modern Wonder Woman. She's more savvy. She's not sort of like an innocent... You think of Wonder Woman and you sort of think of a doe-eyed... Like, if you go back to the 70s show with Linda Carter and she's all like, <laughs> I don't really know what's going on, but I'm super <laughs> tough. <laughs> Punch. And you... You, that's got its appeal, but it's kind of you want somebody, like Mike said in the in the uh, cheesecake episode, you want someone who can sass you, and she can sass. Now, now she can sass. You know what? I've never been a fan of Wonder Woman because I've always seen her as such a flat character, and even after reading these issues, I'm still like. It, the character just doesn't grab me. I don't see her as being... Like, when she's considered one of the top three, my question is, why? Like, I don't... Like, I just don't see it personally. I don't connect with her. Um, it's not that, like, I don't connect with her because she's a female character. It's just, like... She's just boring. I think there's, there's that... There's no change. I think that Wonder Woman struggles from a lot of the same problems that Superman has, where Superman... I love Superman, and I, I have literally fought people. I have fought my close personal friends for saying Superman is boring. But the reasons I like Superman are very... I don't connect with Superman. I don't read Superman stories and go like, oh, that's just like me. That's somebody that I know. Um, I think it's very... I love Superman because he represents this heroic ideal, and I feel like it's very much the same for Wonder Woman, where even if she's not 
I don't read Wonder Woman comics, and I'm like, Wonder Woman is like my buddy who I would want to hang out with. And I think that's kind of the goal at Marvel is to make uh, where like Marvel focuses on these characters and like making them very focuses more on the people behind the masks, whereas DC focuses on these heroic archetypes. And that's what Wonder Woman is. She's like the original ultimate female superhero. She's so, no Booster Gold or Blue Beetle. Mm-hmm. So I guess I would ask then, uh, what types of female characters or what specific female characters do catch people's attention and what is the sort of characteristic, uh, main characteristic of a character that's interesting? Is it something that's relatable? Because uh, as Billy just pointed out, that's not always the case. Uh, you know, I like a lot of escapist uh, you know, storylines that are like taking me far away from reality as possible. If there was a character that took the train to work, you know, every day and sat in a cubicle, I don't. As much as I relate, <laughs> as much as I'd relate to that, I uh, don't think I'd appreciate that storyline. So uh, maybe Elena, what do you, what what would you like to see either from uh, Wonder Woman or in any woman female character whatsoever? I think it'd be cool if she got those pants that were advertised. Yeah. So, so Cliff Cliff Chang, I think it was that's uh, that's uh, doing the art for that. Uh, put uh, to clarify for everyone, um, pants on Wonder Woman in the solicitation. Uh, however, it, right on the cover and right in issue number one of the New Fifty Two, a uh, Wonder Woman, there were no such pants. The uh, the, the pants are a lie, uh, as it were. Uh, it was too hot outside. You can't wear pants in this weather. Like, come on. Clearly, she needed short shorts. Well, the other female character in the story, at the, in the first issue, also didn't get pants. So, uh, I guess that's fair. Yeah, but I think she was from the Deep South. I am not sure what that means. But, uh, so, do we... How do we feel about Cliff Chang's art, uh, in general, on this, uh, series? Uh, there were so many little things that he did that I loved. Um, one of the things I, like, even, and these are just, like, small touches, uh, the, I've never seen somebody illustrate gods this way before, where all of the gods almost... They look kind of like aliens. Like Hermes, he looks like, uh, like you know, like elongated head, like big eyes that are just black. He looks like something out of signs. And I, it's interesting seeing them portray gods as, like, as almost like an entirely different species. Well, they are almost portraying the gods there as their, like, abilities to, and what they represent. Um, and that was... I really enjoyed um, Hades, the way that he was drawn. Yeah. Um, and, like, that was really good. I had a lot of issues with some of the ways that Wonder Woman was drawn. There were some scenes where it almost seemed like her facial features were too small for her actual head. Like, everything was kind of crammed into one little tiny spot, and there was a whole bunch of just, like... But faces are generically, like symmetrical, I guess you would say, but some of the angle I don't know if it was angles he was trying to work at, but it just didn't play for me. I will, uh, Tony Akins did art on issues 5 and 6, and he, I definitely, I didn't, not sure if I enjoyed it as much as Cliff Chang's, but he did a bunch of things that I thought were interesting also. Um, like, the, the Hades design was really cool. One of, I'm not sure, I don't know who the, the name of the colorist was, but issue number 5 had a very dark-skinned Wonder Woman which I thought was interesting, and it made me kind of remember, like, oh, right, she's she's Greek. She's not, like, a white person, which we always represent her as. I think that's a good point. I think it's... I like a lot how he made her look like she's not some white chick with black hair. She's... I mean, she's white, but she's a Greek. Like, she looks Mediterranean. And I also like in terms of the way Wonder Woman is drawn, that she's drawn with, like, at max, a C cup. Like, her boobs look normal and real, almost. I would agree with you on that one, except for in issue, uh, it was either five or six, they were on the bridge. I'm pretty sure it was five, because it was before uh, she had met with um, uh, Poseidon. But... She was standing on the bridge, she was wearing her black gown, oh, and yeah. it was nothing but boobs. But she's wearing her, like, push-up thing underneath that, so... But it was nothing but boobs. That was, it was like... And I, that stood out for me. Like, not looking for it, but it was just like boobs. Going back to the whole cheesecake conversation... This is, uh, this is very unrelated, but I liked a lot of the little touches that they did with the art. 
uh, like bringing the centaurs from the first issue back as like Hera is still <laughs> using these two centaurs who already got their asses kicked by Wonder Woman as her hitman again. And one, one of them even, like, Wonder Woman literally cut its arm off. And instead of going thinking, like, oh, you know, maybe I should send a new thing to fight off Wonder Woman, I get Hera just, like, duct taped a mace to the severed stump of the arm. <laughs> that's, like, that's some KGB shit, and I love that. It's interesting the way things come back. Like, this is just a thing that I noticed as I was reading it in the trade for the first time since I read it, like, sequentially, um, month to month. But the way that the words are placed in, the like, the dialogue, it's all, like, somebody doesn't finish their sentence and then someone in the next panel finishes the sentence for them in a different context. And then Brian Azzarello is, like, doing this on every other page and you're like it's it's kind it's of like weird. archer yeah so before we before we jump into uh, any more uh, topics here uh, we'll end it here for the today's episode and if you want to hear more about what we have to say about Wonder Woman please follow us uh, to the link below about uh, the extended version of today's episode and that's a wrap for another episode of the comic book showcase join us again live via chat or Twitter next week like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And to learn more about today's topics, check out the Marvel and DC databases on Wikia, the ultimate resources for comic book information anywhere.